morning, Second Baptist. Please st stand with us as we get ready to worship. Um, and uh, we're going to start with a very famous scripture. I don't, are there famous scriptures? <laughs> this, this one is probably the first one that most people learn and, um, and remember and memorize. Uh, but maybe not everybody's memorized it. So uh, we're going to put it up on the screen. It is on the screen. Yes, John 3.16. Oh, this in the corner. All right, so let's say it together, okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, cause Jesus paid it all. seated. Right, as we about to go into our time of prayer, um, and uh, just before we uh, get into that, I wanted to mention a couple of things. So Easter is coming. Uh, we usually have a, a pretty packed house out. So a couple of little changes we're going to do is that uh, that section in, in the back on my left over there, uh, that's going to be opened up for, uh, for whoever, but our, our middle section and this section over here will still be for, for Mass only. Um, and that's just a way to, to serve folks, but we're starting to fill out in, in, the, in the top part, so we'll have that section. Uh, and remember, on Easter Sunday, that's one of those times that people will actually say yes when you invite them to church, so invite people. Um, and, and we'll make sure that we have the room. So, uh, yeah, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we are so grateful for this season that we are, that's drawing near, God. The, we, every Sunday, we remember your death and resurrection, how it gives us life, uh, how it changed the world. Um, but Lord, especially as we uh, draw near to that, that day, that special day that we set apart. We pray that you would use uh, next Sunday, the Good Friday service and Easter service, Lord, to draw people to yourself. And God, we know that you go before us. And Lord, it, you're not just about those in this room, those in our church. You're about reaching those who 
uh, Lord, have not known you, who have not called upon your name, and we know that you use us for that purpose. So God, would you be working in us? Would you be drawing uh, people to you? And give us those opportunities, God, where we can share your love, where we can talk about what Easter means to us, Lord. It's not just about the bunny. It's really not about him at all. It's about you, Lord, conquering sin, Satan, and death, not just for you, but on our behalf as well. And Lord, we rejoice in that. And Lord, as we observe the Lord's Supper today, we also uh, rejoice and remember your broken body and your shed blood. And uh, Lord, how that gives us life. So Lord, would you move in this time today? Would you use every song, Lord, every prayer, every every testimony to glorify yourself, to draw us near to you. So open our hearts, God. We don't want to leave this place the same. We want to, when we go from these doors, we pray that we would have a, a, a changed life. Even if it's just taking one additional step towards you, Lord, may we do that today. And show us, Lord, each one of us, how we can take that step, that commitment to you. And Lord, when we come into your presence, we also think of those who uh, need your intervention, your healing hand. And we praise you for the ways that you've answered prayer. But Lord, we now lift up to you, uh, Terry Trompke, went back into the hospital. We pray your healing hand upon her. Lord, we pray for Mark Fleming and for Beth. And Lord, we pray that you'd strengthen them and be with them in a powerful way. And Lord, for uh, those who are here now and who have different issues and different prayer requests, Lord, you hear our hearts. You know the issues that we have, and we lift them up to you. Lord, intervene. We entrust you with all of the things on our hearts, the healing that many need, the, the forgiveness, the restoration, the guidance. Lord, we lift these things up to you now, the, these different issues, and we entrust them to you, knowing that you're qualified, and Lord, you are loving. So hear the prayers of our hearts now. And Lord, those who are joining us online as, as they lift up their prayer requests too. Lord, I pray for the Lamaries and uh, Lord, the situation in Ecuador that you would bring, um, you bring help to the rescue workers and, and all that's going on there that happened last week. Uh, Lord, we pray for Ukraine. Lord, you bring peace there. Lord, that through all of that heartache and, and war and violence, Somehow, Lord, you would make a way. And Lord, for those who are uh, throughout this world who don't have the freedom that we have to worship you without fear, to worship you openly, we pray you would strengthen them. Lord, we think about our brothers and sisters who are in hiding in different countries because they can't worship you openly. We pray you'd protect them and strengthen them. Lord, as we rejoice in our freedom, in the abundance you give. But Lord, we, we repent for not using this freedom and this abundance we have to further your kingdom. We, we use it for ourselves, but Lord, we pray that we would use it to further your ways and your kingdom and your goodness. And that all that we have, we would not cling to it as if it's our own, but Lord, we would use it for others and to bless others and to bless you, God. So show us, show us how we, Lord, can make a difference in our church and our families and in our community. And Lord, we pray in the way that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. Please stand.
its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to his home far away.
praise you, God. As we were singing that, I kept feeling God speak to me, and it was almost like I don't know, disconcerting, um, like trying to focus on two things. But like he just kept speaking to my heart, don't ever let it get old. Don't ever let it get old. And that's all I could keep thinking as we were singing that truth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. Let those words never go in one ear and out the other. Let them always change our hearts, God. God, may those words never grow old. May that mystery always remain in our heart and on our minds, God. And may it lead us to change. May it lead us to seek you more and more, God. Lord, I thank you for that amazing truth that you gave your son for us while we were yet sinners, God. You sacrificed your only son for us. Through nothing that we've done or could ever do, Lord, it is only by your grace and help us be mindful of that every single day to walk in gratitude and to walk in a way, God, that honors you and honors all that you have done and that you do in our lives. We thank you and praise you this morning for that amazing gift. And Lord, this morning, um, we lift up our children and the workers who are going to work in Kids Church. God, I pray for each precious child, God, that they will know this truth, God, that they will know that you sent your son to die for them, Lord, that they may have eternal life and that they may have life with you always and forever, God. So I pray that you will bless their time, that Holy Spirit, you will lead their time as they learn about you this morning. And God, here in this room, as we hear testimonies of people whose lives have been changed by you, God, first I, I pray that you will help these people speak with boldness, Lord. Help them not be nervous. Give them freedom, God, to share with their brothers and sisters all of the good things that you have done in their lives. God, I thank you for their story ahead of time, God, because I'm excited to hear it. And I pray for all of us, Lord, that hearing what you do in someone else's life will be an inspiration to us, God, and will remind us of all the things you've done in our lives, Lord, that maybe next time there will be more up here giving testimony to you and your good works, Lord, that you have done. Continue to guide us this morning, and may all that we do bring honor and glory to your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so those who are going to Children's Church, everyone else can be seated. Those who are going to Children's Church, you can follow me. Sam's out in the back door, and let's get going, kids, all right? I'll move it. Well, this, uh, today is a, a, a special Sunday. We're having, a, it's a, I call it a testimony Sunday. Uh, we just finished our series through the book of Habakkuk, um, and we're heading into the Easter season, and I thought, you know, it'd be, it'd be great to have a, a testimony Sunday. And well, let me explain what that is. What's a testimony? A testimony is basically telling others about what Jesus has done in your life. I, on a very basic level, a testimony is telling other people about what Jesus has done in your life. And, and because Jesus does a lot of different things at different times, a lot of times you have a, a, a different testimony every week, right? And it's like, this is what God did for me this week. This is what God did for me this week. Now, there's also a testimony in that you can testify to how you first came to faith in Jesus, Right? And, and that, that one probably doesn't change, but sometimes you emphasize different parts. And these, this is very biblical. So if you read the book of Acts, one of the things that the Apostle Paul does a couple of times is he gives his testimony about how he went from being a persecutor of the church to um, a proclaimer of Jesus' message. And he testifies before uh, different leaders to that. So it's very biblical to give testimony, but you can also testify to 
uh, some particular occasion where, where God helped you or God showed up in your life in a, in a particular way. So, for instance, in John chapter 9, Jesus heals a man who was born blind. And then he goes and he testifies. He tells uh, actually a group of Pharisees about how Jesus did that. Now, they, didn't, they, did, they weren't too open to it, but he still, he, he testified to that. Because your story can get others to connect with God for themselves, right? And that's why testimonies are so powerful. And in fact, uh, I just want to share one short scripture with you um, of, of, how, of this happening uh, in the Jesus Basics series that I've been doing. I, I, I touched on this, but uh, the Samaritan woman, um, there, was, there was a woman of Samaria, and remember, she was kind of outcast, and Jesus, he, he meets her and talks with her, reveals himself as Messiah, then she goes, even though she's an outcast, she goes and she tells her whole town about Jesus. She gives testimony to this Jesus, and then the whole town comes after him. So uh, just in, in John chapter uh, 4, verses 39, he, it says, many Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So see, that's what testimonies do, is that it points to God, and it gets people interested and gets people looking for God themselves. And then before you know it, they say, wait, we're not following God because of your testimony. We, we've discovered him ourselves. We believe in him ourselves. And so now we've followed. And that's the power of testimony. It's throughout scripture. So today we've got a couple folks who are going to give testimony. And, um, and if, if you're inspired or whatever, let them know. But also, um, you know, hopefully we'll do this again. Uh, and, and do other testimonies. So uh, the first uh, person who's going to come uh, give testimony is uh, Susan McSpadden. And so we're glad that she's coming up. She's our Awana commander. <laughs> All sorts of cool things, but I'll let her. heartbeat and nervous system. <laughs> well, this is not going to be hard at all. <laughs> not that I'm not excited to share my deepest, darkest secrets with all of you and the rest of the online world. <laughs> I am grateful for this opportunity to share with you what um, Jesus has done in my life. Um, it sounded so easy, right? There, there's so much, and as Pastor Joe just mentioned, it changes every day. There, there really is so much, so so, uh, so I sat down on my computer and, um, and I like stared at a blank screen for quite a while. So uh, I um, prayed about it, and three days later, Pastor Joe gave me the answer in his uh, second to last sermon on uh, living by faith when the world is falling apart. See, God's already working. Talked about um, Habakkuk, 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 Habba, Habba, little, little help, please. Habakkuk. Uh, I don't know how to, I don't know the Old Testament as well as my kids do. <laughs> so uh, Habakkuk did just that. He was able to praise the Lord by remembering and embracing his past. Okay, so maybe to explore what Jesus has really done, I'll not just rattle off some, some things about how I feel about Jesus and my relationship with him now, but to really remember and embrace my past and my journey. Uh, so I could do that. Oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> but here goes. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Amen. I have an ugly past. My um, childhood was. 
characterized by abuse, neglect, fear, uncertainty, a broken family, <clears throat> and a solid footing down a deep, dark, dark path of destruction. And uh, although I was raised Catholic, my education stopped when I was in eighth, when I was eight years old. Please forgive me, I need to leave that there. God and I are still working on that. <laughs> From that point on, I uh, attended church irregularly. I, mean, I, I was there, but I wasn't there. It was just kind of checking the box. Fast forward to 20 years, uh, to the middle of my very grueling Air Force pilot training, when my big sister, my rock, my best friend, lost her brief battle with cancer. Well, the little faith I had was, was pretty shaken, and, and, I, and I did start to pray again, um, but my heart still wasn't there. Fast forward again eight years later when my youngest daughter, you all know Elliot, Sherry, Elliot after my grandmother, Sherry after my big sister, both of whom died of liver cancer, she was born and I endured almost two years of severe postpartum depression. Yeah, it's a thing. <laughs> How hard is it to get help, right, for these days, but when you don't know that you're in it, you can't seek the help. But, and I was really good at hiding it, uh, which made things so much worse. I got so angry at God all the time, and I kept asking why. I even read the entire Bible for the first time in my life, which, which is not easy as it sounds, right? You open a book, you start reading. Well, it, when you, with, with a tough background, confusing and muddling things, it, it, I couldn't just start that way. Thankfully, I started a second master's in theology, and, and uh, that helped me kind of get through it. And I developed this, um, this, this passion. I was slowly starting to understand. I was slowly starting to get it. Pieces were starting to get filled in. Is everything okay? Do we need to ask for help? or, or? Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so slowly starting to understand, and I was closer to God than I ever thought I was before. I mean, I thought things were great. <laughs> but, but God knew I hadn't given my life to him yet. I look back on it now, and I can see God working in my life. And, and if he, all of these ugly things in my past had not happened the way they had happened to shape me, I never would have survived what came next. On February 17th, 2016, don't cry yet. i got to get through this. <laughs> my child was diagnosed with a life-threatening brain malformation, something that I couldn't fix simply by going mama bear on someone. <laughs> Boston Children's Hospital, uh, Connecticut Children's, nobody had any, any idea what to do. No, they've never seen anything like it before. So many moments in my life had shaken me, but never to my core like this. For me, uh, nothing could have tested my faith more than my life's, my child's life being threatened. So I broke. I didn't realize it at the time. I'm so grateful to say this now. Um, when you're in great pain, you run to the person you trust, to the person who loves you. And I ran to God. I began this journal. You can't read it. <laughs> it's called God's Miracle, and I wrote on the front of it, Dear Malformation, our God is so much bigger than you. It started on February 17, 2016, and there's no end date because we're not, we're not there yet. Uh, she's got another one in, uh, later on this year. I didn't, I didn't realize that this book, this journey, would be about so much more than saving my daughter. 
It saved me. Two years later, we found the best neurosurgeon in the world. He's uh, written nine books on brain malformations, and he's never seen her condition. There's no, not even a name for it. Um, but he's really the best that there is, right in our backyard, right in New York City. He's done, he's done brain surgery to babies in utero through the umbilical cord, and uh, he was willing to give it a shot. And I'm so grateful to say that after five brain surgeries, we've moved from life-threatening to only life-threatening if we don't keep doing what we're doing. And she's, she's going to be fine. She's great. It's wonderful. <laughs> well, the years since the start of this journey have been filled with one major challenge after another, tragedy upon tragedy, injuries that have threatened my, my mental health, setbacks, so many more things. You can all relate to this. I know you can. You've heard the saying that God will never give you more than you can handle? I respectfully disagree. <laughs> God's going to give you more than you can handle, but you weren't meant to do it alone. Yeah. I can often hear uh, Jesus saying to me, not out loud, but just in here, that I didn't bring you this far just to bring you this far. Habakkuk, Habakkuk, 318 from last week's sermon says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. I would love to end this testimony by telling you, yes, I'm there. I can take the joy, joy in the God of my salvation no matter what's happening in my life. I'm not, I'm not fully there. I am a work in progress and as much as I would love for it to be like my Hallmark movies where they all end with an awkward kiss, but then everything's great, everything's happy, right? It definitely doesn't work that way. I don't have all the answers, but I do know where to find them. And I've, I've learned that if the answers that I want if the answers that I'm looking for are not here, then I'm not asking the right question. And maybe I don't need the answer because I already have everything I need. I'm just going to end in a quick prayer. So thank you, Jesus, for blessing me by giving me more than I can handle. Because now I have the gift of love and support for my church family, who I can share this with and hopefully encourage someone here today. But most of all, God, I have... I now have the most precious of gifts. I have you, my Lord, my Savior, our Father in heaven. Amen. So thanks for listening, for loving, for supporting. Oh, and for not judging this hot mess. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. And, and yeah, it's, it's hard to be transparent like that. And so I appreciate that so much, Susan. And I know that you really, you've spoken to me, you've spoken to, to us, and God has spoken through you. So I appreciate that. Now I'm going to ask Peter to come up. You know, Peter's been with us for a, a couple of years, but I re realized as I was thinking about this that a lot of you haven't heard some of Peter's story. And so I asked Peter to, uh, to come and share some about how what God has done in his life uh, as well. Thank you. That's a hard testimony to follow. Uh, I thank Susan. That's really touched my heart um, and encouraged me very much. Yep. Yep. So um, St. Augustine said, um, he quoted, I couldn't look at the sun directly. Uh, but I can look at where the light fell. And uh, Philip Yancey wrote a recent memoir called Where the Light Fell. 
Uh, it's a great book. You should read it at some point. But I just kind of was touched by that title, and I kind of want to use that title, Where the Light Fell, to share my, um, my co conversion experience. Uh, I want to kind of use that framework in three areas of my life, mentors, music, and family. Uh, that's where the light fell for me. Uh, my parents immigrated to the United States in the mid-70s, and um, I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1978. Um, my parents were first-generation immigrants from South Korea uh, who barely spoke English and came to America to start a new life. Uh, they quickly discovered that new life in America would not be easy and that they would struggle most of the time. Barely speaking the language and trying to make ends meet, they only knew one way, which was to work hard and make a better future for their for their children, even though they didn't fully know what they would be doing, doing and what that would look like. My family life growing up had a significant impact in my life. Um, I grew up in a bit of a messy, um, quite tense uh, family life. Um, there was much tension growing up in my family, um, maybe some dysfunctionality. And, um, uh, and my relationship with my dad was quite tense. Uh, I don't think my dad was quite ready for all the things that was happening in his new life in America, raising a family, trying to figure out what he's doing, fatherhood, being a husband, uh, and the list goes on and on. Um, my mom, she... Um, she started to go to church, started attending church. And I think at church, she felt um, a place where she belonged. Um, and she met friends there. So it was kind of a safe haven, safe place for my mom to go um, in their struggle, in, in her struggle. So ever since I remember, my mom took my sister and I to church all the time. And we're sleeping on the pews. Maybe you're, some of you are sleeping right now. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, I would sleep because I was a kid. And she was there way too long. And Korean church, it goes on forever. Um, um, and, um, yeah, my mom's the first spiritual influence in my life. Um, you know, she taught me how to pray, how to read the Bible. And... Um, and uh, yeah, um, she was a very, she is still a very devout Christian uh, in my family. Um, my elementary school years kind of whizzed by, and I uh, got to middle school, and middle school was pretty rough. Um, kind of think of it as a inner city middle school. There was a lot of fights, um, a lot of bad things happening uh, in my school. And um, one of the biggest issues that I was facing growing up was, um, was my kind of finding my sense of identity. Like I couldn't figure out who I was. Um, growing up as an Asian American, you know, trying to find my place amongst my friends in my school, uh, was very difficult, so I had no confidence, and um, and I didn't have much self-esteem. I was not comfortable in my own skin, and I was lost. I didn't know what I was doing. I hated, you know, going to school. Things were just um, very depressing and discouraging, and so I was a very shy, timid, and... Um, uh, an introvert, like um, growing up, and uh, I had a hard time expressing myself. Uh, finally, one day, a youth pastor comes to visit my mom, and she invites me, or 
uh, she, she tells her um, that um, she would like Peter, you know, would he like to come to my youth meeting, to the youth meeting? And she, my mom asked, and I was open to that. So Brother Bo started picking me up every Tuesday after school to go to prayer meetings um, at his youth group, at the youth group. So I started going to the youth group every Tuesday. And this is where I started to um, learn more about the faith. And Brother Bo, he kind of took me under his wings. Uh, and he was my first Christian mentor um, that had a big impact in my life. Um, and it was finally here that I was able to uh, experience friendship and where I felt like I belonged. There were youth group members there that took me under their wings. And um, I just felt at peace. And I, I, I enjoyed being with them. And Brother Bo taught me how to pray. Uh, he taught me worship songs. He taught me the Bible. And, um, and I was enjoying this time. And so um, in the summer of 94, right before my fresh, freshman year of high school, Brother Bo takes all of us to a, uh, a worship, praise and worship conference in Washington, D.C. And so we go there. And um, it was at the age of 14 that, um, that I confessed Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I remember that time. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I, I grew up in the church, but this was my first encounter where it became personal. Like I was, I took ownership of my faith. And when they had the altar call that night, I, um, you know, I remember vividly just looking out the window at that time, and time kind of stopped for me. And there was so much peace outside, you know, and there was, it was basically nature out there. But um, I, you know, confessed my sins, and I, I accepted the Lord Jesus into my heart. And that was, again, like where I took ownership of my faith. And ownership meaning that, you know, I gave my life to Christ, and I, I, I um, had a personal encounter with God. And I go back to, you know, uh, Texas. That's where I grew up. Uh, so uh, born in Philadelphia, but I moved to Texas when I was around two years old. And, and I just grew up there. And, um, you know, going back to high school um, or entering into high school, I was still trying to figure things out. But now I had this new encounter with Christ. And um, there was this... Um, just this longing to be in God's presence. So I became more active in my youth group at church. And, um, and I, you know, I, you know, I enjoyed my time at church. This is where I felt my sense of identity. Like I felt a place where I belonged and I, uh, I felt comfortable at peace with who I was. And um, every Friday night, we would have a uh, prayer meeting um, at church. And um, I still remember those nights, you know, we would have our Friday night service. And then um, at nine o'clock, you know, we would start praying. So everybody would get on the, you know, out of their pews on their knees. And we would just have this prayer night all night. And um, I'm a teenager, ninth grade, 10th grade. Um, but I'm praying my heart out. And I come, so I, after youth group, I would come, and I don't know why I would go, you know. I should go home and just play around or go out joyriding or something. Uh, but I came in the sanctuary, and the, and the way Korean-style prayer goes is we all pray out loud, right? Uh, it's kind of a collective prayer, and some people like to call it Korean-style prayer because everybody's just crying out. And uh, we will start... Uh, Koreans, uh, we, we start prayer by crying out Lord three times in Korean. Chiyo, chiyo, chiyo. Right? Um, and, so, um, and so we would cry that out, but the way I'm crying out in the Korean church, it's about a hundred times much louder. <laughs> like it will, break, it will shake you to the core. You're like, what's going on? Um, but that's the context that I grew up in. 
uh, and praying. And it was really crazy because uh, when I would pray, I would be able to pour out my heart. All the stress, all the pressure, all the craziness happening at home, at school. God allowed me to, to pray and let all those things out. And um, God was healing me at that time. He was training me at that time. And um, I still remember those prayers um, that, you know, that I was able to experience the power of prayer in my high school years. Um, and then uh, I graduated and I attended college. And it, at, it was at college that I start, started to learn how to play guitar. And I started getting into music. Um, and um, I had a, um, another mentor and a really close college roommate of mine who taught me how to play guitar. And it was through this music um, that I experienced God's power. Um, music, you know, growing up as a kid, I wasn't, again, I was very shy. And I don't think I was shy just naturally. The, I think the kind of the, the nurturing aspect of life, the upbringing of life kind of made me that way in a bit. Um, so I knew I had something in me, and music brought that out of me. Like when I played music, I learned guitar, I started singing, learning worship songs. My, the deep things in my heart and soul started to ring out. You know, when I'm just, you know, speaking, my day-to-day -day life, I couldn't really express, couldn't really you know, uh, be really who I really was. But through music, I was able to let that out. Somehow, some powerful thing was happening in my heart. And, you know, in college, I joined the praise and worship ministry. And, you know, I did a lot of worship leading, you know, um, and entering into God's presence and uh, experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. And, um, and this had a powerful, again, um, impact in my life. God was... Um, just touching my heart and my life through music, and I can experience his power. And to this day, I still love to do that. You know, all my free time, I just pick up my guitar, start jamming, and um, worship God, and it brings me peace. You know, I experience God's peace uh, in my life. Um, and, um, yeah. And uh, finally is... Um, my family, my family, um, you know, um, getting married and having children uh, has also been another area where the light has fallen in my life. And God has shown me so many things, um, you know, through my family, my weaknesses, that a lot of my weaknesses he, sh he shows me every day, um, my strengths as well. And through my children, he shows me unconditional love. Um, and, you know, uh, through my wife, my better half, um, she's always, you know, um, always there as, as uh, my anchor, as the one who's, you know, um, supporting me and helping me along this path. And um, it's still like, um, it's still a journey. I'm still on this journey. There's still so many things I need to learn. There's so many things that I need to still iron out, right, with God. But um, one thing I do know is that, um, you know, we don't get to choose which family we come from. You know, we can't say, oh, God, I want to be born in that family, of that group, of that, that, and that. No, we don't have that choice. We're born into the family, to the family we're born in, and we have the upbringing that we have. It's, that's not in our control, you know, that's the hand that we're dealt. But God knows. God is sovereign. And he doesn't waste anything. All the, whatever, the suffering or the hardship, you know, um, God orchestrates all those things into his good plan. We can't see it, but if we continue to persevere, right, and we don't give up, right, God gives us a voice. God gives us an identity, and that's why now I've, I'm comfortable in my own sins because I know I'm a child of God, born in his image. And the awesome part is we all are. We're all born in God's image. We're all vulnerable before the Lord, right? 
and we're all, you know, in this same journey, um, you know, um, going to Christ, going to the old rugged cross where he's going to exchange it one day for a crown. And so that's my hope, you know, that's my uh, testimony that, um, you know, God gives us the bravery, he gives us the courage, the identity, and now I am very proud. I'm very confident because I represent Christ, not all my upbringing and all that. That's all part of it. So, um, yes, all glory to God, and thank you for listening. So what has God done in your life? You know, we heard some, some stories, and there's probably a part of each one of these stories that you can relate to, and that's the power of a testimony, is that there's something, and you can say, wait a minute, I see how God worked in Susan's life, in Peter's life, and, and then sometimes you say, and that's, now that I look at it, that's how he's working in my life. Or you can say, I want him to work in my life like that. And you can come before him and pray. And that's that's what's so wonderful about God is that he's so much bigger than any one of us. He's, He's bigger than the world, and yet he's close. He's close. And he will work in our individual lives and do something in your journey. And we've seen that, and and it's been testified, and that's wonderful. And as we go into this time of the Lord's Supper, you know, that's a testimony. The Lord's Supper is a testimony to what God has done. Also, uh, next week, when we do baptisms, baptism is a testimony. You, it's a symbolic testimony that I'm going under the water. I'm dying to my old self. God has made me new, and I'm, getting, I'm raising up out of the water in newness of life, just like Christ did. Christ's story is my story. That's what baptism is a picture of. So, yeah, next week uh, we'll also be doing a testimony, at least one, like in, in that symbolic sense. But also the Lord's Supper testifies to Christ's work. And when we observe it together as a church, what we're saying is that I'm remembering Jesus' broken body and his shed blood. I'm remembering what he does, and I'm proclaiming. I'm telling people about what he did, and he did it for me. Like, I'm, as Peter had mentioned, like, I'm taking ownership of Jesus. Like, his, his death and resurrection, his broken body and shed blood, they're for me. And I place my faith in that. And so, let's... Uh, Take the the, bre- the the cup, and if uh, Lisa's back there, if anyone did not gra- get one, um, she can uh, give you one. But I want to read, f- I often read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 uh, when we, we observe the Lord's Supper, but I want you now, as I read this, I'm going to read through the whole thing uh, quick before I go through it again, and realize that what we're doing now, this is a testimony, So the Apostle Paul, he says to the church in Corinth, he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance, remembrance of me. Right? We're remembering what Christ did for us. That's testimony. But then notice he says, In the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as you often, and drink it in remembrance of me. But then look, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You see, we proclaim it. We testify to Jesus' death, and that through his death and his resurrection, we have got new life. And that's the amazing testimony that we all share. That's one of the things we all have in common that we're testifying to what Jesus has done. 
so that although all of our stories are a little bit different of how God intersected with us, how he called us to him, the one thing that's the same is that it really is about what Jesus has done. It's really about his broken body and shed blood for us. And that makes us brothers and sisters. I mean, isn't that an amazing thing? Is that, you know, talking about uh, our identity, our identity is found in Christ. Our identity is as brothers and sisters in, in Christ Jesus. So that as we take this communion, what we're doing, when we take this Lord's Supper, it testifies of Christ's work, but it's, it's, it's our amen to what Christ has done. So it's like we have this testimony of Jesus and us taking it in. It's us saying, amen, it is so, it is so with me. That's my testimony, Christ's death and resurrection. That's my story too. When we take the the bread and cup, that's what we're doing. So in that spirit, let's, again, go to the scriptures. The apostle Paul says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we take the bread in remembrance of your broken body. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We take the cup in remembrance of Jesus' shed blood. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we have taken the bread and the cup to remember and to proclaim your broken body and your shed blood. Oh, Lord Jesus, we're so thankful for your sacrifice that gives us new life, that gives us a new story, a new identity. Lord, and I pray for any of those here or those watching online, God, that they would be saying yes to you. They would be saying amen, and they would be testifying to what you've done in their life because, Lord, you've changed each one of us if we trusted in you. Lord, thank you for the, what you've done in Susan McSpadden's life. Thank you what you've done in Peter Yoon's life. Thank you what you've done in so many lives. And Lord, we pray that we would testify. Lord, with our family and our neighbors, we would testify to your goodness. In the, in the today and in the days ahead. But Lord, we testify to your goodness first and foremost. Lord, use this last song as a praise to you, as a confession and a celebration, Lord, that you change lives, that you make us new. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's please stand and let's sing this final song. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power. The blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power. In the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. Would 
bridge you will be wider, much wider than snow. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood. 